All right, thank you so much. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, I'm Gabrielle Hayden. I'm the librarian for research data management and reproducibility at the University of Oregon. But before I did that, I um, got a PhD in 20th century poetry, and I spent three years as a, a visiting professor at Reed College. Um, and it's some of the things that I learned in that former profession that kind of gave me the idea for this talk. Um, so in, in my uh, dissertation work, where I got to do a lot of research at this ridiculously beautiful and inappropriately wealthy library, the Beinecke Library, one of the things I was looking at was the ways that Spanish language and literature, uh, or the, the ways that people had biases about Spanish language and literature sometimes suppressed the translation and publishing um, of that literature in the 20th century. And um, so that uh, essentially what struck me was that some of the biased ways that people talk about human languages, I saw some real parallels with the biased language that people use to talk about programming languages. So here I want to stop and say that I'm going to talk about language of bias and um, things that people will say that um, if they were said in earnest would absolutely violate the code of conduct here. And um, so if you're not in the mood to think about sad and stressful things or interactions that you've had in the past, you should totally feel free to just hop off and um, come back. The end of the talk will be um, less about these depressing topics. So you could even just hop off for the next seven minutes. But, um, uh, but, but that was basically just noticing that parallel, right? And, and seeing, so programming languages, like human languages, are social, right? And I think the little scholarship that's done on this, I think there's a lot of consensus, right? They're embedded in existing hierarchies, so just as the way that we talk about human languages is influenced by things like the history of imperial colonies um, uh, and differences in power between um, uh, cultures and nations in the same way. Um, you can see that there are differences in the way that people understand programming languages or who has access to certain programming languages over others or uh, parts of the, um, the computer science and software engineering ecosystems and you know the pay differentials that can be associated with that. So another way of saying this in more positive terms is that in the way that we talk about all sorts of human languages, formal computing languages, and other, we have opportunities to emphasize solidarity or division. So here's just a selection of um, kind of classic uh, gendered put downs that, um, you know, my, my thought for this, uh, the inspiration for this con context was really kind of running across these kinds of things. Often people don't say this type of stuff outright. It's more like you notice oh, at this company I'm working at, it seems like there are more women working in the front end, or there's an assumption that that would be the case, um, those kinds of things. But it was very interesting because once I started to look into it, of course, I saw that actually this kind of way of putting down things that are newer, potentially more accessible, that, that change who's using the technology, um, are often getting put down in the same way, but in this kind of gendered, uh, gendered language. And that really harkens back to a way of um, putting down other people's languages that goes back quite a long way, right? So just, um, I could have taken things from my dissertation, but I actually thought it would be useful to think about how this goes back a lot farther. So this is a fantastic um, feminist and uh, post-colonial analysis of the Gospel of St. Paul and his role in history and talking about the way that he is pushing back against this language within Rome of imperial conquest being associated with masculinity and conquered lands and languages being associated with femininity, right? And you have this like image um, of potentially of sexual violence here on the cover, right? Of the Roman soldier and the feminine, uh, the female, uh, figure who sort of stands in for lands conquered by Rome. Um, and you see that uh, more recently in the 20th century with uh, 
Um, so I was studying Ezra Pound, among other writers, and you know you can see here he's talking about um, he's sort of making a direct parallel between well Spanish literature is good when Spain has power. Um, now that it doesn't, it's feminine, and, and uh, then he just throws in some gratuitous racism. So, okay, um, on the one hand, that's a kind of depressing thing to notice. On the other hand, I think it's useful when we run across this kind of um, toxic language to, to know that it has this sort of long and, um, in a way, un, un, unoriginal, uninteresting genealogy. Um, but of course, um, I think that if you were to have this conversation on Reddit, you would come across a lot of people who would say, well, but aren't some programming languages better than others? I'm actually not much of a programmer, although I do um, help teach some intro R and Python in my work, and I am excited to be learning more. But I'm not someone who's gonna have this opinion uh, very strongly. Well, who does care about the answer to this question? But the, the folks we've, we've just been alluding to, um, but then also people who design and write programming languages, right? I mean, unlike human languages, which develop completely organically, uh, program, unlike human languages develop, that develop organically, programming languages are written by people and, and they're written to be successful. Um, and so, so the people who design them want other people to adopt them. And uh, they are also thinking about this. So this is a great article from 2015 by um, uh, a CMU professor, Jean Yang and Ari Rabkin, um, that talk about, um, that question this kind of, again, this, this kind of uh, faux technical language. And there, that essay actually comes out of this great study um, called the Sociology of Programming Language Adoption that Rabkin did with uh, Leo Meyerovich, um, where they surveyed developers and asked them, you know, why are you choosing one language over another? And I think their sense was as people who wrote programming languages or who are involved in the development of programming languages, you know, that people would care about things like development speed and, and correctness. Um, I think, uh, all of these very specific um, technical things. I mean, you can think about if you're an advanced mathematician, there's all sorts of fun work I think that can be done. Um, but in fact, what they found was no, developers ultimately are choosing uh, languages based on you know, who they know and what, uh, what those people are using, right? Open source libraries. Um, powerful existing code, personal familiarity, team familiarity, so that those uh, interpersonal dynamics are, are the things that really, that really matter. But there are still people who are thinking about uh, the differences between languages and how that might affect people. And here again, there's sort of interesting parallels between the way that we talk about human languages and the way that we talk about programming languages. So um, German Romanticism, that's the 1700s and early 1800s, there was a lot of talk about language representing the spirit of a people or the folk of a people. And this was in the context of really empowering the German language over say Latin and, and you know, really thinking about the um, uh, mother tongue and and how and thinking about that as as a font of literary inspiration and so on. Um, the, a more recent version of of this in the 20th century is what people tend to call the Sapir Whorf hypothesis, which is that this idea that the structure of language of human languages can influence how we think. Um, and I think there's a general sense that that is not true in a in a really strong way, but that there can be a subtle, uh, the subtle structures of language can subtly affect what we're paying attention to within the language or what we're sort of, in, the ways that we're invited to speak. Um, and what's interesting is that there are people now who are doing research around those questions um, within programming languages as well. So the Knowledge Lab at the U Chicago just got a Sloan Foundation grant to do a bunch of machine learning analysis of 
the way that people are using uh, computer programming languages. Um, really thinking about that. Um, there's also a, a fantastic um, talk that's still available on uh, the Wayback Machine by the inventor of Ruby, where he talks about having written Ruby really very much with the, the Sacker-Whorf hypothesis in mind, and in particular, um, the way that it's articulated in this fantastic novel um, by Samuel R. Delaney. If you don't know him, he is uh, a really uh, great sci-fi novelist who thinks about a lot of smart, interesting stuff. Um, so the the other thing that, that comes up out of this is um, that I don't have time to really get into, but I, I would love it if you guys had questions about it or wanted to, to ch chime in about it in your own experience, is that you know programming languages to a certain degree are based in English, right? So Python was developed by someone from the Netherlands, Ruby by someone from Japan, and yet the sort of small words in there that to the extent that they're human language words are based in English. And um, uh, Yukihiro Matsumoto, and I don't know that I'm saying his name right, who developed Ruby in the same talk, which I highly recommend that you go back and look at all the slides for because it's hilarious, um, you know, starts out by saying, you know, when someone came to talk about Ruby in Japan, we got them an English translator because he had looked at Jap Japanese for two weeks. And But here I have to stand before you with my bad English. Um, I need to suffer just because I was born in Japan. <laughs> Life is unfair. But he's really, I mean, it's, it's, he's, being, he's being cute, but of course it does reflect real structural imbalances in um, how, how easily people can access uh, language. And then maybe how they feel about it too. So Geek Sublime is a, a beautiful set of essays about um, all of these issues. Uh, this is your five minute warning. Okay. Great. And one of the things he talks about is the origin of um, of computer languages being inspired in part by semiotics, uh, which is kind of a forebearer of a certain strand of linguistics, um, and that in turn having been really inspired by this brilliant Sanskrit grammarian from the 4th century BCE who made a grammar of Sanskrit that can really be understood according to the most recent arguments by scholars as a kind of precursor to a, uh, a formal uh, language or even a computing language. So it's fascinating. I don't know Sanskrit and I'm not a logician, but if you want to go down that rabbit hole, I got really excited and read, skimmed a lot of AB logic stuff that I didn't fully understand. So totally fascinating stuff. But you know, this is also something where when I mentioned this to a colleague who worked in tech, they said, oh, you know, uh, I had heard of that because someone, you know, that I talked to who was being kind of bro -y, who was from India was like, oh yeah, well, you know, it all came from Panini, right? And there's that sense of wanting to express a kind of national pride um, or, or a cultural contribution uh, when the programming languages are so dominated by Eng the English language and by English language companies. And then I'll just mention one other study that um, kind of gets into this um, is a chapter in Critical Code Studies, this new book out from MIT Press about Flowmatic, which was written by Grace Hopper and was a precursor to COBOL. Uh, which is sort of focused on business folks, which in turn you can imagine as a kind of very early precursor to Excel in certain ways in terms of its focus on the business audience. Um, and just talking about how um, that was a matter of bringing more English in. And then I just want to end with noting that Excel is one of the only sort of platforms for programming languages that actually allows you to program in your language. So there's the Excel, the German version, and, and so on. So I want to end end by asking some questions that I hope can lead to some conversation either now or in the Slack. So, you know, how has language chauvinism affected your relationship to particular programming languages or your access to opportunity? If your first language is not English, do you feel that the fact that programming languages are based in English affects your work, or do you see it affecting others?
And are there strategies you found helpful for interrupting language chauvinism? So uh, no uh, obligation, but if you're interested, I am totally fascinated to hear your thoughts. So um, yeah, so I'm just gonna stop there. Somehow I wanted there to be a more uplifting note at the end of this, but this is me on Twitter. Come find me if you want. Um, and uh, yeah, I want to continue to think and talk more about about interrupting these these kinds of associations, or just noticing the ways that they are truly unoriginal. Gabrielle, thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I just want to give a, a little comment on in terms of the time we've got left. We've got five or six minutes, so certainly time to ask a few questions or to have that discussion and in fact we could go a little bit um experimental and if anybody would like to come up on um come up onto the screen and engage in any of those questions then i would be happy to do that we've got a question that's come in uh and okay gabrielle i will i'll read it out um uh and it's from melissa klein thank you melissa um and they say, I'm curious whether you've looked at similar effects within programming languages, i.e. the dialects that develop in a particular workplace or set of packages. So tidyverse versus base R. You know, I haven't, but I'd really like to. I mean, this was really, um, uh, this, this talk is like posing the question. And I think that um, the, I, I wanted to be able to come in here with more answers and, and less questions, but I think that to do that really requires a certain amount of more ethnographic research or um, really kind of uh, getting into, so, but I want, I think that's a really good question, right? I mean, it's sort of what follows from that observation that people are choosing languages based on the, the language um, packages and so on. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to keep keep looking into that. How much is the culture of the language due to the actual founders or community that evolves? I think that's a great question from uh, Peter Murray Rust. Um, and something that comes to mind there is um, a recent controversy that some of you will remember better than I about um, about uh, uh, in, a, in a Linux manual, there was a sort of a, an abortion joke um, that was made around the, the abort command. And um, the person who was maintaining it insisted upon keeping it despite the fact that people really uh, didn't like it. And, um, and uh, then that person, and I, I wish I remember their name, just just recently got kicked out of MIT for being a jerk. So, um, so I think in that sense, like the people who are, like so much of the work that is um, gone uh, so beautifully at um, CSV Comp, for example, is that people do this work of maintaining and setting up the culture of, of being inclusive and inviting and respectful. And I think when you have people who are involved who are doing the opposite of that, um, I think you really see that. So yeah, Andromeda Yelton is saying, um, uh, in her opinion, founder effects are very strong. Yeah, absolutely. Any opinions on programming languages not written in English? Yeah, so I'm not, I'm still so new to programming that it's not like I have opinions myself about different programming languages. I mean, I, it seems like there's a big challenge people talk about network effects, right? That um, because many people have to learn um, the English-based programming languages in order to enter in to the conversation, then that's also then what everyone knows. And so there's a kind of bigger audience and there's a kind of um, knock-on effect that you get from uh, uh, just in the sense that the founder maybe of a language can help set the culture, the fact that the early languages were in English then makes it harder to not write in languages that are not in English. Um, 
And uh, so a couple more comments. So several people said this reminded them of the work of Feline Herman, and that was someone who I ran across right at the end of giving this talk, and I am excited to read more about their work. And then um, Jonathan Cain says, it makes me think about conversations this morning about community building and what does this mean for all the work that folks are doing to build inclusive communities. I think that's a great point. And in fact, I had really written, I had meant to say at the very beginning to give a shout out to um, Angela Lee and her talk on data communities and those who build them. I think that these kinds of posturing, right, are the exact opposite of creating the kind of excitement and kindness that we um, work so hard to foster here at CSV Conf. So it felt, it almost felt a little sad to give this paper here in the sense that it's sort of documenting the opposite of, of what we want to build. But I, I hope that there's some value in, in noticing how the operations of our, of the enemies of our inclusive communities. Thank you, Gabrielle. That I think is a, a lovely place to finish.